today we will be talking about uh, proteins, everything to do with proteins, such as the enzyme, proteins, uh, structural proteins, uh, muscles, of course. So let's just get right into it. So we have these structural, structural proteins. And these are proteins that give you uh, um, kind of like stability and structure to your body, okay? So uh, gives structure and stability, okay? So for instance, you have uh, proteins obviously in your skin, but the protein that is specifically in the skin that provides elasticity is called elastin. Okay, and so if you get your tummy and you pinch the, the skin, it'll go back, right? It's not gonna like just droop, right? Hopefully not, <laughs> but that's elastin. And another important structural protein that you may know is uh, collagen. Okay, and collagen is very prominent within facial creams, within re, uh, re, sorry, rejuvenation creams, okay? So it's trying to kind of give back some structural proteins that may have been lost in the uh, face or area, okay? So these are two important structural proteins that you may need to know, okay? And structural proteins, again, give strength to different parts of the body. For instance, they give strength to bones or skin or just other um, areas of the body, okay? Like tendons. Okay, so after that, let's talk about some uh, enzymes, okay? So enzymes are pretty short. There's not much here, okay? But essentially, they're proteins that kind of serve as catalyst, uh, catalyst, okay? So proteins that speed up reactions. They're proteins that speed up chemical reactions within the body, or specifically within the cells. Not much you need to know about that one. It's just kind of like a tidbit, I guess. Then, of course, whenever people think of proteins, especially me, I think of muscles, because muscles are made from um, proteins, okay? So we also have these uh, muscle contractions, okay? So muscles and uh, mo mobility, so... They allow you to move, okay? And so let's see here. Um, okay, so yeah, if I remember correctly, and I usually do, the two important proteins that allow your muscles to function and allow you to move and exist in this weird universe, they're, they're called actin. Yeah, so you have something actin up, right? <laughs> so actin and myosin. Actin and myosin, right? And these guys actually uh, make up the skeletal muscle. That's an A, okay? It's weird. So that makes up the skeletal muscle, all right? Very cool. Let's try to clear the screen, right? And over here, let's see, we also have kind of like protective proteins. So proteins that make up the immune system. So we, we're, gonna, we're just gonna call them immune immune uh, proteins uh, aka protective okay. so what do these guys do what do you think they do well if they're protective they're gonna be defending you okay so these proteins are like your ride or die okay because if you die obviously they don't exist so obviously they have to protect you and essentially, they kind of, mm, it's like, since they defend you, they obviously make up the antibodies, okay? So proteins uh, that can make up antibodies. So antibodies in your, in your body, like uh, white blood cells, are actually made from proteins. Okay? Um... So, for instance, you have white blood cells, and these white blood cells will gang up on viruses and bacteria, and probably something weird you ate or something, you know, like a Salisbury steak. I never liked those. So I like to think that my white blood cells, which are made of proteins, are going to be attacking and ganging up 
on this uh, foreign substance, okay? So your proteins can make up antibodies. And of course, you also have the regulatory and receptor proteins. So what are those? Because it seems really complicated. So we're just going to put um, receptor proteins. I'm just going to put an exclamation mark. I mean, you know, why not? I haven't seen him in a while. There you go. Um, so essentially, they're like proteins that mm, regulate physiological activity. Okay, so what does that mean? You remember homeostasis back in like pre-K? Well, there's proteins in the body that have a kind of like set point. Okay, so a set point is uh, something in your body that if anything deviates from the set point, you're going to enter homeostasis. So for instance, in temperature, the set point, the temperature that your body wants to be at is 98.6. If you get too hot, your proteins are going to react, okay, and they're going to try to bring your body heat uh, down, either by sweating, right? If you're too cold, then you're like 98.4. Well, the set point is 98.6, and your proteins are going to react and try to bring the body up in temperature. So you're going to shiver or something, right? So of course, the main things um, that regulate physiological activity. So let's see, regulate physiological uh, activities. So it's, uh, for instance, you have your hormones. So hormones actually, uh, you know, try to regulate things. Okay. Hormones themselves are not regulated, so they actually do the regulating for the body, okay? Uh, also, you have DNA building proteins, so proteins that make up the DNA. And, um, well, you also have proteins that kind of like that well, I just want to say they they help hormones. So you also have proteins that help hormones. Okay, um, and I'm not really gonna get into that. I I don't think you need to know it. Uh, for instance, it could be like aspartame, uh, right? So. Yeah, aspartame was like a taste receptor. It's also like a foreign sugar. Uh, proteins can kind of like regulate how you perceive that. And it, it just gets into like this whole mess. But essentially all you need to know that receptor proteins regulate physiological activities. Uh, hormones are proteins that do that. And also you can find them in your DNA. Um, proteins themselves help with the formation or the regulation of hormones, okay? Hormones themselves are not regulated by homeostasis. Now we will talk about the interactions between proteins themselves. So proteins can react selectively with other proteins. Uh, so remember the example I gave with Mean Girls and um, it's a good movie, but the example with Mean Girls and Entropy. So there was a lot of disorder and whatnot. They're, they're really picky. But another example can be made with proteins. Uh, proteins aren't just going to like bind with other proteins all willy-nilly. They actually have standards, right? Unlike um, some other compounds in the body, proteins will actually um, have a preference to what they combine with. So proteins, proteins uh, kind of like interact selectively, okay? So they interact selectively. They're very picky about who they are friends with, right? And um, when they do interact, they don't form covalent bonds. So when you remember in the formation of uh, proteins via amino acids, you had a covalent bond formation. Well, whenever the proteins themselves react with other proteins, that is not a covalent interaction. So these are non, these are non-covalent, non-covalent bonds. Um, proteins themselves can react with enzymes because enzymes themselves are proteins. So proteins 
and interact with uh, enzymes. Okay, there we go. And of course, since DNA, if you use the same logic, proteins can interact with DNA. Okay, of course, when they do interact, these are non-covalent interactions. So if they're non-covalent interactions, what are they? Well, non-covalent interactions are actually this. So I'm going to put um, NCI for non-covalent interactions. So NCI, okay. It, well, they're made of you know electrostatic interactions. So like electricity or ionic interactions, I would say. So you could put electro static interactions. Uh, you also have steric interactions, okay? So that's kind of kind of weird, but proteins can react uh, with sterics, okay? So whenever proteins do react with each other, they want to get into like the best uh, conformation that allows them to waste as little energy as possible, okay? They're not gonna, you know, bump heads at like the, the, the biggest part of the protein structure, that's gonna be bad. You know, you're gonna waste so much energy uh, interacting with each other, and that's gonna be really bad, okay? And obviously they uh, it, they interact with uh, van der Waal, van der uh, Waal. So let's do that. Uh, interactions. Okay, so these are like nonpolar um, bonds, right? Or very, very, very electronegative bonds. And of course, you also have H bonding between the proteins. Okay. Now we will talk about protein structures, okay? So proteins can actually come in two packages for us, okay? So proteins can come in a globular form. So globular means that they are spherical or almost spherical, okay? So this is like a spherical shape. All right, and fibrous just means that it's kind of like a string. So um, they kind of look like uh, ribbons that have been coiled around and around, okay? So these are like strands, right? So these are strands. So what's the difference between globular proteins and fibrous proteins? Well, globular proteins can actually be classified as, well, you can say that they're, they're soluble in water, okay? So they're charged groups, and we'll write that in red. So these can actually are sol uh, dissolve in water, okay? So these are polar, so these are polar, and can, you know, blend with water, so water soluble. Okay, so lots of charged groups, lots of charged groups. Okay, now these guys right here, well, here's a good example. Here we have actin, okay, we have actin. And actin is one of the muscle pro uh, fibers, okay? Uh, myosin is not a good example, but actin is. So actin is gonna be acting in a good way for us, and it's gonna be acting in a dynamic and flexible way. So actin is gonna be uh, kind of like flexible and dynamic. So you can say that the whole group right here is going to be uh, flexible, flexible and dynamic. Okay, so if you remember that actin is a globular protein, then you know that actin is going to be actin flexible and actin dynamic. Okay, and remember that globular proteins are water soluble because they have a lot of charged groups, meaning that they are polar. Okay, but uh, what about their brother, uh, fibrous proteins? So fibrous proteins are again like strands or like um, the shoelace on your shoe. Okay. And they're not fire. Uh, well, they're not soluble in water, so they're like the opposites of these guys. Okay, so they have a lot of hydrophobic nonpolar R groups. 
Okay, so there are uh, hydrophobic. They are hydrophobic and nonpolar. And this usually occurs in the R groups of the amino acids that build up the proteins. I'm just going to say amino acid is AA. Um, R chains of amino acid. Okay, there you go. And well, fibrous uh, proteins are actually quite tough. Okay, so uh, keratin. Here we go, keratin, which is present in your hair and your nails, well, they're very tough, okay? So unless you have a medical uh, condition where your nails are very brittle, uh, keratin is gonna be one of the toughest uh, fibrous proteins out there, okay? So fibrous proteins are very, very tough. Tough, uh, physically, okay? They're tough. So an example, again, would be the hair, the nails, or the skin, right? Now, both of these guys, both globular proteins and fibrous proteins, well, you know, um, they make up the whole body, right? They make up the whole body, and I think they're very important for you to know, right? But before I forget, and I almost forgot, uh, fibrous proteins, fibrous proteins can do what? Well, Well, they can be elongated, okay? So usually uh, globular proteins are not elongated, obviously. Uh, for instance, if you had a rubber ball, you're not gonna expe uh, expect the ball to be elongated or long. You expect it to be short and stubby. But with fibrous proteins, they're gonna be very elongated, okay? So they are, are elongated, okay? There you go. Now, if we talk about both of them in general, like I was going to, you can actually have both of them um, in the membrane proteins, okay? So let's write this in, I guess, a very nice color. Let's pick, uh, I'm feeling a little orange today, okay? So both, both can be uh, membrane proteins. Usually, however, usually globular proteins are the one that make up membrane proteins, okay? Because you have like transports and storages, you know, so usually it's globular, but they can uh, be both. And of course, uh, with many things, um, proteins, both of them, can be monomers, okay? So monomers are just a singular uh, polypeptide chain, so uh, can be monomers which are just a single polypeptide chain. Okay, chain, right? Or they can be oligomers. So oligomers are multiple polypeptide chains. So if you had a polypeptide of like alanine, okay? So let's say you have one chain that has two alanines, okay? and then you combine it with a chain that has five alanines. Well, when you combine them together, you're gonna have an oligomere. So an oligomere, so an oligomere is just a, um, kind of like multiple polypeptide chains, okay? Right, so both of them can do it. And um, if, let's say that you're working with like this huge system of proteins, okay? Well, each polypeptide chain or oligomere can be a subunit of a complex. So now it's getting a little uh, complicated, but what I'm trying to say is if you have this, let's for imagine um, a machine, okay? Well, in that machine, you can have little computer parts like a motherboard. Well, in that motherboard, you can have little chips, and that's the basic um, item for that structure, okay? So the chips are kind of like monomers, but whenever the chips are together, they make up a polypeptide. But whenever you have a bunch of motherboards, the polypeptides, together, they make up uh, kind of like a machine. 
So if you have a bunch of polypeptides that are joined together in an oligomer, and then a bunch of oligomers combine together to make what? To make uh, a complex. So those oligomers would be classified as a subunit. So it just kind of like builds up on itself. And it gets like a, a snowball. It starts off small and then it grows and grows. Uh, a complex can be a little subunit for something else. But uh, that gets really complicated. Okay. Oh, and also, um, both of these guys are held together by non-covalent interactions. Okay, so remember protein, when it interacts with other proteins, it interacts via a non-covalent interaction. For instance, van der Waal, H bonding, um, electrostatic interactions, or even steric interactions, okay? Now we will talk about the four levels of the protein structures, okay? So the primary structure, often labeled as uh, one a dot or whatever, so essentially that is just a linear sequence of amino acids in a protein, okay? So for example, let's just use alanine, okay? Let's just always use alanine for an example. So essentially what, what it is is that you have alanine with another alanine with another alanine uh, with another alanine, etc. Okay, into like infinity, let's say. Okay, so you have one uh, chain of alanine proteins. But what if you had another chain of alanine proteins like this? Right, so what if we had that? Well, if we combine them together, they're going to make uh, some, some lines, right? So they're going to make this uh, nice chain of proteins. Okay, so that's cool. But um, what else? Well, if we, I should say, combine the um, chains together. So if we get one chain of um, one chain of alanine proteins and combine them with another chain of alanine proteins, we're gonna get kind of like a a three D structure. Okay. So this three D structure, again, let's say that this part right here is all alanine. And let's say that this part right here is a, I don't know, like a, for example, tyrosine, let's just say. Well, if we combine them together, we're actually going to get a secondary structure, which is 3D, and that is gonna make a beta plated sheet. So that's called a, uh, a beta sheet, okay? And we'll talk about beta sheets in a few minutes, okay? And essentially, that's just a collection of polypeptide chains. Right? The same thing for alpha helix, okay? Alpha helixes are just a collection of linear um, protein chains, okay? So there you go. If you want to kind of get into the specifics, you can say that it is a uh, 3D shape. So you can say that this is, for secondary, you can say it's a 3D shape, okay? Of the peptide backbone. And this, actually, one of the most important things, it, is, um, it ignores, ignores the conformation of the side chains. So you could say it ignores the sterics of the side chains. Okay, so it doesn't matter if one thing looks wonky, it's gonna be placed into a 3D shape, okay? So that's, uh, specifically if you look at the beta sheet, um, that is going to ignore the sterics for the R groups, okay? All right, so what about tertiary? Tertiary. Well, tertiary, <laughs> they're just a collection of these beta sheets, of these alpha helixes, of these other loops, okay? So. Like I said, imagine a machine. So this is a machine right here. But that machine has parts, and that part is made from other parts, and those parts are made from the most basic part, right? So we're kind of uh, stepping up in the complexity of the, um, I guess, substances, right? So this right here for tertiary is kind of like a, hmm, it's kind of like a, a global 
arrangement of secondary structures. So <laughs> I'll say that in like a, a nicer term. So it's kind of like the ultimate structure for the secondary secondary uh, level, right? Think of it as like a seating arrangement. Yeah, you have your, your players now, but where do they go? Well, the tertiary structure says, okay, well, beta, uh, beta sheet, you sit here. Alpha helix, you sit there. Loops, you go there and you do a loop-de-loop -loop or something, and we all know where to go. So it's kind of like organized, okay? So it kind of gives organization to the secondary structures. So it gives, gives organization to secondary structures. And we're just calling call that struct, okay? Struct. Um, it does that for structures and R groups. Because obviously the R groups are within the secondary structures, okay? Um, now, whenever you get to quaternary, which is like the level four, right? So now you have multiple, you have multiple complexes that are going to be rearranged. So this would be a complex right here. That's a collection of parts. This is going to be another collection of parts, and that's another collection of parts. And together they follow another seating arrangement, and those make up other um, units in the body, okay? So this is uh, arrangement, arrangement of multiple, oh, that was a really bad F. So of multiple proteins into what, you know, scientists call uh, complexes. We will now talk about the protein structures in really, really specific detail. So this is when we start talking about alpha helixes and beta sheets. So I, I've been kind of teasing you, like putting it uh, out there, right? And you might be curious about what I'm talking about. So in this section of the video, I actually get into the alpha helix and why it's so important and how it benefits you in your daily lives. So Alpha helixes are actually specifically in the secondary structure for proteins. Okay, so you'll find in the secondary structure of proteins that you will have alpha helix. So that's an alpha, all right? And you're going to have helix. And then you're also going to have the beta sheet. Okay, so you're going to have beta sheets. So what exactly are these two um, words, I guess? Well, alpha helix is essentially a structure of proteins that kind of intertwine with each other. All right, so you have these polypeptide chains that come together to form something beautiful, uh, physically and kind of chemically beautiful, right? So we're gonna get into the alpha helix now. Okay, so that in the red is actually an alpha helix. Okay, so the first thing you need to uh, realize is that alpha helixes are actually kind of like a, um, it's like a phone cord structure, right? So it looks like a phone cord. And what you see here is the red ribbon is the alpha helix, right? So again, it looks like a phone cord for you who were born in the 90s, right? Um, <laughs> so. Alpha helixes actually only involve one polypeptide chain. So for um, time purposes, um, an alpha helix is going to be written as alpha uh, H, okay? So that's gonna be called alpha helix, okay? And um, beta sheet is gonna be written as this, okay? So beta sheet, right? So an alpha helix only involves only involves uh, one polypeptide chain. Uh, chain, okay, so imagine in our example, if the most simplest one would be a chain of alanines, okay, so that whole infinite length of alanines can kind of coil up a little bit and it could form an alpha helix. So. Oh, again, alpha helixes only involves one polypeptide chain, okay? And ne you need to know that 
the main atoms. Okay, so the main atoms are going to be within the uh, within the alpha helix. So if you kind of think 3D, if you kind of think 3D, okay, you have this noodle looking thing, okay, and that's the ribbons. So these noodle looking things have their most important um, compounds within the noodle. But what is outside? So the outside could be, you know, the R groups whenever you're we're, uh, working with amino acids, okay? So the R groups are going to be outside, okay? And it could be uh, anything like um, uh, cyclohexane or whatever. But the most important things are going to be inside doing all the work, being protected, okay? So that's what you need to know. So of course, you have that the main chains are going to be uh, inside. So main groups are inside. Okay, uh, R groups are outside. Okay, there we go. Now alpha helixes are actually stabilized by H bonds. So I don't know if you remember, but in one of the introductory videos, I was talking about H bonds and how they're so weak. But if you have uh, a million, trillion, gazillion hydrogen bonds, they're going to be strong and they're going to influence biochemistry, this whole course. So it is one of those cases where um, hydrogen bonds actually do dictate the protein structure. Okay, so uh, alpha helixes, alpha helixes are stabilized. Uh, by hydrogen bonding, so we'll call that H bonding. Okay, there we go. And well, now you're gonna kind of get into like this uh, weird, confusing formula. But essentially, the carboxyl group, so C O O, or sorry, C double bond to O, is actually going to be H bonded. It's H bonded. So let's do this guy right here. And um, it's like this to the hydrogen, I would say. Actually, this is a pretty good example right here. So if you kind of zoom in, you have the carbon double bonded to the oxygen, and that is going to attach itself to the hydrogen. That is bonded to the nitrogen right there, okay? So what does that mean for us? Well, what it means is that if you want to think in a formula, you have that N plus 4. So in simple terms, the first carbon is going to pair up with the fourth nitrogen down the line, okay? So essentially, 1 plus 4 is 5, right? I hope you understand that. So the fourth nitrogen is about five um, structures away. In this example right here, in this example right here, we will start at carbon one, okay? We will start at carbon one. So we go one, two, three, four, five, right? Okay, well the first carbon is hydrogen bonded to the fifth nitrogen, okay? So that's four um, structures away, but the fifth nitrogen is bonded to the first carbon. Likewise, if you were to restart, you would say one, two, three, and then you would have like a, they're missing one, but they would have like four, and then this is five, right? So, I mean, that's really important to know because that's actually gonna dictate the structure for the alpha helix. So what I'm trying to say is that the carboxyl group, so carboxyl group, okay, kind of uh, H bonds with the NH, that's um, four carbons away, you can say. And I really like that picture because it actually does show the hydrogen bonding together, okay? Uh, this one, not so much. This is kind of like a spaghetti 
right? It's not it's not that good. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so that's pretty much like the most important things. You could get nitpicky, I guess. Uh, you can say that uh, one turn. So if you go here. If you say that that is one turn, then it is about um, 3.6 amino acids per turn. Okay, so if you were to get a shoelace or a ribbon, right, and you were to do one little loop right here, so it's kind of like this. Well, per that one loop, that is about 3.6 amino acids, okay? So per turn. And the length of the turn, right? So how much ribbon is used to make a turn is about, I think, 5.4 angstroms. Okay, so we can say, we can say, this is, is about uh, 5.4 angstroms. Okay, so 5.4 angstroms per turn. Okay, cool. So that's kind of like getting into nitpicky if you're a completionist or if you're taking the MCAT. So if you hadn't noticed, uh, most of my videos are actually focusing on in-depth uh, information because that information will be on the MCAT, which is um, kind of what I'm studying for. And if you're studying for the MCAT, congrats, right? Um, so what direction, what direction is the alpha helix red? Well, you know, normally you're actually going to start uh, reading in the amino terminus. So that's a fancy way to say the positive side. So remember that the amino acid is uh, whenever you make a polypep polypeptide uh, bond, you will have something like this, right? Uh, positive, right? And then you're also going to have a COO negative on the other side. So like a battery, you go from positive to negative, right? So um, it's not it's not a pet bull song, um, negative to positive. I just want you to know that. Um, so it's not that. <laughs> so you actually read from positive to negative. So go from left to right. Left to right. And it's positive. Positive to uh, negative. Okay, there we go. So also, um, kind of like an important fact, okay? Uh, all proteins, okay, well, yeah, so all proteins are right-handed. What does that mean? Hmm. Well, when a protein is right-handed, it means that it's going to go towards the right. <laughs> Woo, right? So proteins are actually going to go towards the right over here. They're going to go there. And this one is going to be turning towards the right as well. Right? So, um... Helices or helixes, whatever. Well, they could be left-handed or right-handed. Okay. Um, if you want an example, I recommend getting a water bottle or something with a, a cap, right? And try to open it. Okay. Try to open it. Whenever you open it, your thumb is going to be pointing downwards, and then you're going to twist towards the right. Okay. So that is a right-handed twist. Now, if you're going to close something, right? You're going to also put your thumb down to the floor and grab the lid and twist towards the left. And that's a closing motion that's left-handed. So proteins uh, open up so many chances to kind of, you know, grow as a person. So they're the right thing to focus on. Since proteins are very open, you're going to open up the lid towards the right, okay? And um, they're not closed. So... Proteins, if you want to remember, are always, always uh, right-handed, okay? Uh, for instance, this alpha helix is going to be right-handed as well, okay? So there you go. So let's actually talk about the stability for alpha helixes and what can impact it, okay? So for alpha helixes, you, you don't want to have anything bulky attached. To it okay so what do i mean by bulky well i mean that the r groups that are attached to the amino acids in the chain should not be uh, large okay so for instance uh, proline is going to be very very disgusting 
to work with, and um, alpha helixes are, are not made with proline. Okay, they're almost never made with proline because if you remember correctly, uh, proline has a structure like this, and you're probably sick of me uh, writing it out, but you should always uh, practice, right? You should always practice. So here we go. Here's a nitrogen, uh, carbon, and COO uh, negative, let's say that. Okay, and then we have the hydrogen. And of course, you're going to have what? Actually, for proline, you see, for proline, you're not going to have that. Proline is a little weird, remember? So proline is uh, it's going to have kind of like H2N, not H3N. So let's delete that. Okay. And now let's go back. So H2N, that. And then we're actually going to connect it, right? So we have h right here then we have this bad boy right there okay so that uh, little pentagon looking thing is actually the r group and you do not want to have that in the alpha helix especially when you have so many twists and turns do you really want to see this all over the structure like no dude that's so nasty you don't want that okay so proline is not used uh, to make alpha helixes because they are too bulky. They provide a lot of steric hindrance. So proline, let's do that. Proline is, isn't is used because the R chain is too bulky. And it can't twist either, okay? So even if you wanted to use it, proline couldn't twist to like a, a nicer um, conformation. So it's just not good. Um, too bulky. And can't twist. Can't twist. So what other uh, amino acid can we not use? Well, another amino acid that we can't use would have to be H3N, carbon, COO, negative, and then uh, hydrogen, and what else? another hydrogen, okay? So why is this not useful? Well, you don't want to use glycine, if you remember this, so this is glycine. And this is uh, proline. Because it is too mobile, okay? So the amino acid is too small uh, the, well, the R chain is too small, and it's just not going to be very favorable within the alpha helix, okay? Um, it's like, how should I say? It could be depronated, and you want your structure to be very, very stable. You don't want the potential for, um, you know, depronation within a protein structure, because if you are depronated, your protein structure can actually change, and if it changes, it might not... Uh, do what it was intended to do, okay? So if you're making um, kind of like hair or whatever, right, like alpha keratin, uh, if you depronate some proteins, well, they might not become keratins. They might be something bad. You know, they might hurt you. So glycine is not going to be able to uh, form alpha helixes because they have the potential to actually depronate, right? So not often, but it's not good anyways, right? So if you have a car that, you know, it runs, um, but there's some times where it doesn't run, you know, you don't want that, okay? You're not going to use it. And then you're also uh, not going to have uh, very many alpha helixes with amino acids that have too many positive or negative uh, side groups, okay? So, uh, for instance, it's kind of like if you have uh, tyrosine, right? And let's say that this is actually, um, you know, depronated, right? And then you try to pair it up with a serine, with a serine. Well, that's really bad. So imagine like the R group is just kind of the standard uh, amino acid form, okay? And 
if you were to kind of make an alpha helix with so many, and I mean like a lot, of tyrosines and serines, well, eventually one of them is going to kind of interact with each other. So you might have something like this. Okay. And that's negative. And then you might have something that is interacting. So one of these guys might have a CH2. And then an oxygen right there that's negative. And so do you want that? Do you want two magnets that are on the same pole to be really, really close to each other? No, because if these two oxygens are going to be close to each other, they're going to be repulsive. They're going to repel each other. And that causes an increase of energy, and it takes up more energy to make the alpha helix. Uh, your body wants to use the least amount of energy to survive. So if you have too many R groups that are um, kind of like sterically, um, well, not sterically, but electronegatively um, compatible, you don't want that. You don't want uh, oxygen with oxygen. Okay, and the same thing is true for positives. If you have something that is negative and it's very close to something that is positive, it's going to be reacting with each other and they're gonna to try to kinda of move over here. And so you have these ribbons or these turns that are trying to get closer and closer to each other and that's not good, okay? Because that also requires energy. So what I'm trying to say is do not use amino acids that have a lot of positive and negative um, side chains okay maybe a couple sparingly but it's not efficient to use it you know in repetition so it's kind of weird uh, to say that so um yeah that's that's about it um i guess you could say that well let's let me clear the board first all right so uh like i was saying before i stopped myself i was going to say uh i guess you could talk about amphipathic uh, alpha helixes. So this is going to be called an amphipathic. Uh, so am, uh, amphipathic pathic, uh, alpha helix. Okay, so what is amphipath amphipathic? So amphipathic means that it is a substance that has both hydrophobic and hydrophilic um, components to it. Okay, so what do I mean by that? Uh, what I mean is that these structures are exactly the same, okay? They're just uh, different ways of viewing it, okay? So this is the ball and stick method, and this is kind of like the, um, I guess, chubby method, maybe? I don't know, it's kind of cute. But essentially, what I'm trying to say is that alpha helixes have their hydrophobic amino acid groups w on, on the inside, okay? On the inside. So hydrophobic groups, uh, for instance, like leucine, um, isoleucine, alanine, right? Those are going to be inside. So hydrophobic groups, and I should say amino acids, hydrophobic amino acids are in the inside. Okay, the inside. And the polar, and polar, or charged, for instance, like um, serine or tyrosine, okay, they're going to be on the outside. Okay, so why is that? Well, your body is actually made of, you know, an aqueous environment. So let's say that in a pretend universe that inside your body, there's water, like an ocean filled with water, okay? And you have these proteins that are just swimming around in that water right? Do you want your hydrophobic uh, substances to be interacting with a whole environment of water? No, because they're going to try to avoid it and they're trying to make barriers. They're, essentially, they're going to be using a lot of energy to avoid the water that surrounds them, okay? So your body has, you know, created um, a way to actually survive. So your polar or charged amino acids are going to be outside you know, interacting with the water that surrounds them. And they're gonna be safeguarding the hydrophobic uh, amino acids, okay? So you can kind of think of it as like a, a tank, right? So you have this tank that has the hydrophobic um, guys hiding inside, being protected from the water. And then you have your hydrophilic amino acids that are interacting with the water, making friends, uh, doing what it needs to do. And they're protecting their um, hydrophobic amino acids. Okay. 
Now, finally, we will talk about uh, coiled coil, uh, sorry, coiled coil structures. Okay, so it's kind of redundant, but coiled uh, coils for alpha helix. Okay, so what is that? All right, so if you focus on helix A, that is an individual alpha helix. Okay, so imagine just one ribbon. Right now, what if we have one ribbon and then we put it really close to another ribbon? Well, they're going to be interacting, and then they're going to form something else. So if you have a collection of alpha helixes, you actually start to build uh, a lot of structures. For instance, uh, coiled coils give you uh, hair. It gives hair. And uh, nails, right? And the amino acid that is uh, actually responsible for the hair and nails is actually uh, cysteine. Okay, so... Cysteine. Okay, so pretty sure I forgot an E right there. And this one right here is actually going to have what? It's going to have an SH bond, right? So that's kind of like a uh, disulfide bond, okay? And does the uh, disulfide bond is going to be found in the hair, okay? And it's also found in the skin. So coiled coils uh, are found in the skin as well. And that's what gives it its elasticity. So if you like poke your arm, your skin is going to go inside and then it's going to pop out. So you can thank alpha helixes for doing that for you. Okay. So what else do you need to know? You don't necessarily need to know this, but whenever uh, you're getting your hair done and you want a permanent uh, wave in your hair or curls or whatever, the um, the person doing your hair is going to kind of, um, he's, well, they're going to put something in your hair that is going to break the disulfide bonds and the, and the uh, cysteine, okay? And then they're going to put what? They're going to put uh, a concentrated mixture of, so, you know, like peroxide, right? Okay, so you go to the beauty salon, right? And then you ask for some curls. They say, okay, well, we're gonna put something in your hair and that's gonna be the activator, okay? And what the activator does is that it breaks down the bonds between the S and the H and the cysteine in your hair, okay? And now since the alpha helixes are kind of like slightly more um, malleable, okay? Because alpha helixes are naturally very rigid, very firm. But once you start breaking bonds, they become softer and they can move around. And they put your hair in curlers, right? So they're actually moving the alpha helixes, they're shifting it. And then when they want to stop, they put the hydrogen peroxide in your hair. And now that is going to do some chemical reactions, adding back the H's right there, and your hair is going to be rigid, okay? So you go from a little baby hair, okay, to what? To some curly baby hair. So now you got some curly baby hair. And of course, the, the babies don't really have uh, their curly hair yet because you need to go to the beauty salon and get their appointment done, okay? so. That is how uh, hair um, waviness is created. Okay, so it's just the manipulation of the alpha helixes, specifically the disulfide bond in the cysteine amino acid. Okay. And that is the end of this video. I'm going to talk about beta sheets in the next video because that's going to take a lot of time. There's a lot of information within that uh, subject. Okay, so. Um, hopefully this video helped you understand alpha helixes and the basic information needed to understand them. Okay, I uh, hope you have a great day and that uh, you do well on your exams. Thank you so much and have a great day. Love you.